I'm gonna be asking three analysts of three different levels the same technical questions that get harder over time. Level one has never worked in cybersecurity, he only worked in help desk and he got a few certifications like security plus and now he's trying to land his first analyst position. He considers himself ready for the role. The second analyst has been working for about six to seven months as an analyst. The third level is somebody that works at CrowdStrike and he's a senior analyst. Although he didn't want his voice to be included, so I will do a voiceover for him. You're the one who wanted the cyber slope. Yeah, I have never really heard of WMI. I would assume that it gives access to maybe some upper-ended management or admin type controls. Yeah, I have no idea, bro. <laughs> it has many uses, but people usually use them for the event consumers and reconnaissance. It can also be used for lateral movement and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, probably somewhere... Um, you know, on the machine itself, you could check within the registry, within the logs, see if even after you feel like you may have removed that, um, see if there's anything strange still going on on the lower level. Because maybe... I look at task scheduler, event viewer, see if there's any processes that shouldn't be running or running, and uh, check any registry key modifications. There are many places to check, the most common ones being startup folder, run keys, but since the amount of places they can be in is limited, I just have a script automatically checking all of them so I don't have to do it manually every single time. It catches pretty much all of them. This looks like, I mean, it's a bunch of directories, but I feel like I've seen these specifically when looking at like regex stuff. That's my guess. Yeah, I feel like this has to do with editing the registry. These look like registry keys to me. I'm guessing some sort of persistence is being set up based on the last words on each command. Little trouble there. Run, run once, run. Registry run keys and persistence locations, but it's not just registry locations because the last one is not in the registry. I would call them auto start extensibility points, but you can also just call them persistence mechanisms. For all of them, you would create a value inside of these run keys that would have data referencing a specific PowerShell or file to run when the computer starts. Get WMI object, I'd say that'd probably be a bit suspicious, especially if they're looking for something specific like the 32 files or configs, whatever it may be. That seems like a bit of a suspicious one. I'm not too sure what that is, but I'll, I'll just say it's regular because it seems like something people use for real reasons. All of these could have legit uses, so they wouldn't be outright malicious, but some of them are more suspicious than others, especially when paired with each other. The first one is fine though, it's just getting information on the operating system. No profile, honestly can't remember what that does. I'm just gonna take a guess that it probably isn't something as you know high on the chart to look into. Um, No profile, don't know what that's for. It's not that long of a command, so. I don't see how people can exploit that. Oh no! By itself, it's not all that dangerous, but it is often used in malicious commands. And if it's paired with something like encoded command, then yeah, it's very suspicious. New object system net web client. Yeah, that's probably a bit more on the suspicious side, probably going to get flagged. It looks like it's having to do with some potential networking, maybe trying to get access to this machine. New object system dot net web client. I think launching any sort of web client from a PowerShell is pretty sus to me, so I would definitely look into that more. This one is almost certainly malicious. In my experience, it's only been bad. It creates a web client instance inside of PowerShell. PowerShell, and it's used to download or upload data, usually getting external malicious code to run in memory. Test connection, that seems like a general troubleshooting type of command. Um, even though it could have some malicious intentions behind it, I wouldn't think it should get flagged. Test connection, that seems like a ping and that's like a normal activity. Yeah, this one's completely benign. Get local group member, group administrators. Yeah, that definitely seems suspicious. Um, they're trying to see which users have local admin access on this machine. And then from there, if they see who, which users do have it, they could try and do some, you know, uh, privilege escalation, get access to these user accounts and get those admin capabilities. I think this is some sort of privilege escalation enumeration, like initially trying to find out what accounts are there. So I would mark that as suspicious. This one's pretty benign. It can be used for discovery sometimes, but by itself, it's really not that scary. Encoded command, you know, I'm gonna say, yeah, that would get flagged. They're trying to hide what could be a long string of suspicious commands um, into something that isn't easily readable, hoping that it won't get caught by, you know, maybe some SIM tools. Encoded commands marked as suspicious. This is quite likely to be malicious. There are few exceptions that I can talk about, but generally when you see this, it is malicious. IEX, honestly not familiar with that, so I'm just gonna say no. IEX probably, um, you know, Internet Explorer. <laughs> probably try to reach out to some malicious site so that i would mark as suspicious invoke expression does have some legit uses but it's very frequently suspicious in fact it's so suspicious that attackers usually have to obfuscate it as well
It's basically used to fetch code and do remote code execution. Fucking Internet Explorer. Invoke command. It seems like it's the start of something, but it doesn't necessarily raise suspicion to me that it would get flagged by some sort of SIM tool. I'm going to say no. I don't know what invoke means, but any sort of normal user, like unless there's like a deployment script, I would also mark that as suspicious. This one's also almost always bad. Um, and then lastly, get service where object status equals running. Maybe. I mean, they're trying to see any running services that are currently on the machine. Again, this could be someone who maybe already works at the company and is trying just to do some general investigating of any suspicious services. But yeah, I guess it could have potential malicious intentions behind it. So I'm going to say, yeah, that's probably going to get flagged. I'd say that that's uh, fine. It seems like maybe uh, system administrator activities. So I will leave that as it is. This one's completely harmless. It just gives a list of running services. Okay, I can't name what every single thing does, every single option does in this command. This seems like a potential malicious script trying to get SSH access into this IP here or using this VPN. Probably has this running a couple different times, not just a single instance, but yeah, it's hard to say what the other options do. I can't tell exactly what it's doing, but I'm going to have to guess. I think it's using SSH to brute force the client VPN. Or no, it's using a client VPN root login to brute force that IP address. It's persistent, so probably every time you restart your computer, it's going to keep trying. Not quite. Um, and that's all I have. It's creating a scheduled task called updater123 that runs over SSH on the attacker side port 7766 and the outbound connection is over port 443. It disables the strict host key checking so it makes it more difficult to be interrupted and then the attacker infrastructure is the attacker VPN at that IP and it's set to run every minute. Strict host key checking being disabled just makes the connection more persistent since they can change the host key without dropping the connection. And the task is configured to run once per minute. I know it definitely has to do with some sort of mail client. So uh, my guess for this is that the malicious actor is looking to see if any mail client is running, specifically for all users on this machine. And they're trying to replace that mail client with something like a spoof version, something malicious, hoping to maybe get access to, um, you know, the credentials for, say, their 365 account. And then from there, if they have that, they can, you know, log in, send out some malicious emails. That's kind of my guess. I think this is some sort of data exfiltration, looking for emails that are bigger than the size. And I don't know. If it's enumerating it or sending it out looking for mail that, that uh, that's valuable okay so adsi is active directory and here it creates a searcher then it filters for objects that are person and then mail it makes a page of 1000 entries and whenever the searcher is set to load properties the only thing it's returning is mail as in uh, email addresses. Basically, it enumerates over all of the active directory that it's in, and it will try to just get all of the emails of all of the users. My best guess as to why they would do this is that in case they lose persistence in an environment that they compromised, they now have the exhaustive email list of every single user in the environment, and it would be pretty trivial to get back in because some user would get fished. But yeah, basically this tries to pull email addresses. <laughs> Dang, this makes me wonder if this is some form of masking or encoding. This almost looks like Morse code or something, but yeah, I don't know, man. It looks like some sort of masking. I don't know what that is at the end, if that's uh, encoded value or hash or something, but yeah, it's kind of hard for me to say. Not too sure. I would consider that suspicious, uh, considering that it's such in DLLs and it's System32. Not a lot of reason to tamper that. I don't know what's been going on. I don't know if that is some sort of encoding, but definitely making modifications. That's all I could say. I have no clue why it's like that, but it's not structured to actually work, uh, although it does look interesting. I don't know what they're trying to do here. Uh, the syntax is invalid for run DLL. Um, I think these are probably interacting directly with the internal Windows code base. I haven't been familiar with, you know, lower level C commands in a while. Man, this looks just like some memory shit. <laughs> Uh, virtual, virtual, maybe memory allocation, remote thread. It sounds like some CPU interaction. So Windows hook X, uh, I don't know what that does, but don't know what that is, but I'd say it's like very low level uh, exploit. These are standard functions for process injection. I mean, I'm familiar somewhat with DLLs. I won't say I'm the most familiar with ACLUI.DLL. I wouldn't really know what that does. Um, but yeah, this seems like trying to run some some sort of DLL. It could be malicious. KB probably sounds for Kerberos. roast. Maybe it's some sort of pass the hash sort of attack. I don't know too much about DLL files. Run DLL is almost always used maliciously since no legitimate user will be running a DLL from an ADS. Oh, you meant the whole thing. Yeah, that's an alternate data string. 
looking at the offset, it seems like they all have different hex values, a bunch of different threads. Now, the main difference I seem to see is the exit times. Um, two, three, and four seem to have exit times of, you know, all matching the same thing. The process identifier, the PPID, I'm going to go on a limb and say number one is legitimate. I think I'd look at the PID and PPID. Uh, and PPID stands for parent. Besides that, I don't see any other differences in them. So one and two have the same PPID. Uh, three and four have different ones. I'm guessing you're, you're saying that there's only one of the legitimate ones. I'm trying to go, go ahead and look at the timestamp and see if something matches up. So I'm going to go with number two. It's a legit one. Uh, I feel like the timestamps match for that. So the only thing we need to look at here is the parent process ID and the timestamp. Service host is always spawned by services, which itself is spawned by system. So this is called process genealogy. The last two are not summoned by system, so it's easy to see that they're not legitimate. And then the last thing we need to look at are the timestamps. So number two closed after services, which can't happen, which means that the only possible legit option is number one. Yeah, so uh, honestly, I think the questions you asked were really decent because during my interview, I pretty much had the same level of difficulty. Maybe maybe this was a little harder, but we had to read um, PowerShells, figure out what those what those were. Like to my level, I didn't do that good, and I didn't do that uh, that much better in my actual interview, and I still passed the job. So like to future people, I guess like just try to like stay calm and like explain as much as you can, uh, whatever artifacts you can get. Uh, don't like panic if you don't know something in the, in the real job you're going to be searching and figuring things out uh but having like like off the top of your head like knowing knowing what a powershell command does uh is going to be pretty useful when things are time sensitive or just like for understanding at a deep level i'm excited to see like what other people are gonna perform like